I think of her as brave, meaning I think that um, we really need folks uh, in the presidency and every public office who want to do the job, not just have it. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. And on this episode of the WAMC News Podcast, we catch up with former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick about the fall campaign. Well, Kamala Harris already made history four years ago when she was elected with President Joe Biden to serve as vice president. Now she's hoping to keep Democrats in control of the White House in an accelerated campaign against former President Trump. It's anyone's guess how November will play out now that the Trump-Biden rematch is off the table. But one person watching closely is former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, who's raising money for Harris's effort in the Bay State, where he served two terms as its first black governor. I caught up with Governor Patrick just ahead of Saturday's fundraiser for Harris in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, To begin with, do you think that President Biden made the right decision to get out of the race? Well, right or wrong, he's made it. I mean, I completely understand how hard it must have been for, for him to do so. Uh, he's, he's had the job he's wanted his whole life, um, and he's done it, I will say, to my thinking, um, in a uh, surprisingly ambitious way and, uh, and in a very successful way. So God bless him. This is um, a man who's given decades of service to the nation and I think explained his reasoning uh, uh, beautifully in his remarks from the Oval Office. Um, and we have an opportunity to re-energize the, uh, the campaign, to, uh, to reach out and appeal to disaffected Democrats and, uh, and, uh, and Republicans and folks of no party. And I think um, we've got the candidate to do just that. How do you think the race has changed with Harris being uh, the, you know, all but certain nominee for the Democrats now? Well, I think it's a it's a jolt of uh, of energy. Um, you can see that in uh, in the reporting of the rally she had, the way that she was so warmly and enthusiastically received when she went by the campaign headquarters to thank the folks who are um, uh, who are doing the hard work every day and encouraging others to uh, to do so and um, showing her. You know, acknowledging that uh, that work and, and encourage them, encouraging them to keep going. Just here in the Berkshires, we were sold out before um, uh, the president made his announcement. We knew that the surrogate the president was sending was the vice president, but you can imagine it's just dialed up to a fever pitch since then. And I'm really, really glad that she is keeping the commitment and coming uh, to Pittsfield, Ian, because. I think small towns um, like Pittsfield all over the country, they rarely get the, you know, the glitter from a uh, presidential candidate showing up. And it's really important uh, for, uh, for folks um, in every corner of the, of the country to understand that this is a, a leader and, uh, and, and this will be an administration that sees them and hears them uh, and uh, is not just paying attention to them at election time, but is, uh, is working to, uh, in partnership to make lives better um, in between elections. So do you, do you know um, Vice President Harris well? I mean, have you talked to her? Um, give us a sense of the, the person behind the candidate. I don't know her well. I first met her when she was in the Senate, and of course she'd had a long public, uh, a long public career before, before that. Um, I know her biography, as everyone uh, everyone does. A person of uh, of uh, modest uh, means who's had um, terrific educational opportunities and made the very most of them, and has tried to lead a life that is about giving, not just taking. Um, and I love that. Um, I love that uh, she represents a new generation, and there's a generation or two behind her and me um, that she also is bringing in to the campaign and into her circle, and I think that's incredibly uh, important. I think of her as brave, meaning I think that um, we really need folks uh, in the presidency and every public office 
who want to do the job, not just have it. And by that, I mean willing to make the hard decisions in our time that are going to leave things better for those who come uh, behind. And not just thinking about accumulating uh, political capital, but, but spending the political capital in order to make somebody else's life and times and opportunity uh, better. And I think of her that way, and I think um, the campaign has launched in such a way that she is feeling that uh, encouragement and expectation uh, from folks, and I think it's up to us to, to kind of feed on that and keep it, uh, keep it going, not just uh, until Election Day, but uh, when she assumes office. Now, Democrats have been making the case that, you know, American norms, democracy as we know it, is on the ballot this year against an emboldened former President Trump. Uh, Do you agree with that framing of this election? Well, look, I think um, I think Donald Trump wants to lead America by fear, you know, fear of the future, fear of our surroundings, fear of the unknown or foreign fear of him. You know, for that matter, uh, fear of each other. And I don't think that this is a time uh, where Democrats can or should respond with caution. We've got to respond uh, with a willingness to step up to the big challenges we face, whether they're economic or social, domestic or or foreign, um, with optimism, with ideas, um, and with humility, frankly, because no one person or no one party has a corner on all the best ideas. I think that uh, when you compare, I I will say, Ian, uh, personally, it's been frustrating to me to some extent that the case we've heard for the re-election of uh, of President Biden has focused almost exclusively uh, on uh, on the hazards of re-electing Donald Trump. And I agree that there are hazards. But if if we have more to say than that, right? Because that job gets done on election day. Um, and the question I think on a lot of people's minds is, and rightly should be, what happens after that? So what's a Where better do we message? Want to lead the country. Yeah, what's a better um, message I, for Democrats? Well, I think it's an additional message, and I think you're beginning to hear it uh, from uh, from the vice president. It's about what it is we want to do with the platform the Biden administration has given us. You know, I, I remember having a conversation with another former governor who was in office as I was during the Great Recession and and just thinking if we had the tools then that are available now, the CHIPS Act and the infrastructure bill and the rescue plan and the and the appetite for innovation and trying new things, the the opportunity to collaborate across sectors, public and pro uh, and uh, and private and non nonprofit uh, uh, sectors to really create economic uh, and social opportunity in every corner of the Commonwealth, it's just, I mean, every cor- corner of the country, is, is unprecedented. And I think that work has to be done. And that has to be done alongside uh, creating more just and inclusive environments uh, around the country and setting a different, uh, a different tone. So a lot of it is about holding on to opportunities that have been created by this president in this administration so that we can build on them going forward and not returning just to what we used to do, um, but actually being far more creative, including new voices and new ideas going forward. And I think Kamala Harris is exactly the person to lead us there. So to that end, how do you, if you're Harris and her campaign, how do you run on the Biden-Harris record over four years without also reminding voters of the things they say they don't like about the administration, like, you know, higher prices at the, the grocery store and problems on the border and that kind of thing? Well, first of all, I don't think you run from those things. Those are, those are realities. I mean, inflation has eased significantly thanks to the, uh, the policies of the Biden administration. And by the way, I'll just take a moment to say, I know a lot of folks blame the Biden administration for inflation. This was a global problem, and there is no single or uh, decision or set of decisions by the Biden administration that explains global inflation. Inflation has been better controlled um, uh, by this administration than any other 
uh, industrialized nation. But frankly, if you are a family paying more for groceries than you used to, you still feel it. So the, 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 the stats don't really uh, explain the case. We have to face that. We have to call it what it is and not treat it like it's something that, uh, uh, that folks oughtn't to be concerned about. What has happened also uh, is that wages have gone up. Um, relative to inflation, they have been stagnated for a long time. That is also uh, that is the wage increase increases uh, associated with decisions and policy choices that the Biden administration has made. It is also true, Ian, that we have a problem at the uh, at the border. Um, we have out of date uh, and, and broken inflation uh, uh, immigration rules and uh, and procedures. But we're not going to. We're not going to solve that problem by, you know, demeaning uh, uh, migrants and, uh, and, and separating parents from children. We're going to solve that problem by facing that problem and collaborating on what it takes to have modernized um, rules. And by the way, when, uh, when the Congress tried to do that um, in a bill that, frankly, a lot of Democrats thought was harsh, but that the president was uh, prepared to sign – it was a bipartisan uh, bill. Um, who nixed it? Um, but Donald Trump right. told Republicans to vote against it. And why? Because they don't want a solution. They want the issue. And I think, you know, the American people deserve a solution. I think we'll get that in the coming, uh, in the coming administration. Let me ask you this. Do you think the situation has changed around having a female nominee since 2016, you know, knowing that there are obvious differences between um, Secretary of State Clinton and Vice President Harris. You know, I have to I have to say, I feel like uh, I feel like the the pundits. I'm, I'm not talking about you, Ian. Um, Thank you for uh, that. I, I feel like the, I feel like the pundit class paint with such a broad um, uh, brush and a lot of people in politics politics underestimate American voters. Um, this is a this is a much more. Um, uh, uh, I think we can trust the American uh, voter to make their choices not limited by um, uh, considerations around gender or race. I mean that's been my my own experience. I mean lots and lots of folks said not only because I was black but because I was unknown. Uh, I think one percent name recognition when our campaign um, started. Uh, for the first term, um, that it, it just couldn't happen in Massachusetts and wouldn't happen in Massachusetts. And yet it did. And it happened because we took the time and showed the respect of going around and introducing um, introducing me and introducing uh, a vision and listening to people and letting them teach me um, what was uh, important and worthwhile and, and building that into the agenda that we brought. I think when we campaign like that and when we govern like that, we win and we deserve to win. And that's what I'm looking for in, uh, in the Harris campaign. I think this candidate has that disposition, um, and I'm hoping her, te- her team brings that approach uh, to the work ahead. Uh, do you have any interest in joining a Harris administration if she does win? Oh, gracious. <laughs> Don't go there. We're first things first. Listen, I'm I am uh, I'm doing everything I can to help uh, Democrats up and down uh, the ticket, and I will do everything I can to help the next Democratic administration. And I think there are lots and lots of ways to serve without being uh, uh, in the administration itself. Okay, well, I had to try, but that's not a no. I'll note. Um, <laughs> who, who do you like for uh, her choice of a vice presidential candidate? I like her choice to be somebody um, she has a real partnership with, because I think one of the things we saw in the Obama administration was that um, they had complementary skills, uh, the president and the vice president, um, and so they had they had a way of leveraging the office of the president. Do you know what I mean? That there were, there were certain things that Joe Biden, as vice president, knew how to do and do well um, that the president didn't, and vice versa. And they, and they worked that as a team. And I think just being able to leverage the talent you have around you is enormously important. And I hope that, um, I hope that uh, 
Vice President Harris is thinking about uh, her uh, range of candidates that way. Uh, local question for you. Do you think you will support the ballot question uh, that would authorize the state auditor to look into the legislature's records? Most lawmakers oppose that idea. I guess so. I, I, I guess most lawmakers do oppose it. I need to look at it more more closely. I, I think there's a um, there there is a there is a genuine constitutional question. I'm not sure the constitutional question is the thing that's bothering lawmakers. But uh, I need to look at it more closely before I give you a uh, point of view, okay. and I will. Uh, just to wrap up, because we don't see this a lot in, in American history. You know, people have been looking back at the LBJ speech saying he would not run for re-election, uh, which is not a, a direct, you know, a predecessor to what happened with Joe Biden. But in Massachusetts, most governors do not run for a third term. Um did you see anything in the last few weeks with President Biden and his ultimate decision and his speech that reminded you of your own decision to leave it at two terms? You know, um, I loved being governor. Not not every day, um, to be sure, but we were uh, we had an ambitious agenda. We got a lot of good done, and we had a team. Now, you know, we didn't, not everything. Was just so nobody accomplishes everything they set out uh, to, but but we had a spirit in our team uh, that was about doing as much good as we could for as many people as we could for as long as we could. And after um, after two terms, uh, my wife Diane said it's time to come home, and she was right. You know, you um, there's a lot of wear and tear uh, involved, and it was someone else's turn. And um, uh, and I I. I I like that. I think two terms is is uh, was plenty for me. There were still things we wanted to do, but it was plenty for me. Um, and um, and I admire. I mean, I, it's hard to overstate really just how gracious um, and um, and self aware uh, President Biden's decision was. Because as I said, he has the job he's always wanted. And he's done it very well. He hasn't gotten the recognition he deserves, but I think he will in history. Um, And he deserves that. So um, passing the torch to a a younger uh, generation is something I I think a lot of folks have had on their minds and hearts. And and he's done so in a very elegant uh, way and and launched a, uh, a potential successor, I think, very, very powerfully. Former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick speaking with us. Um, Governor Patrick, it's always great to hear your voice on WAMC, and I hope we can call you back um, as this campaign gets closer to the fall. Thank you. Please do. Thanks for having me, Ian. Okay, that does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, I'm Ian Pickus.